Welcome to Last Said News, or Dan for short. My name is Rob, and today, just like the thumbnail and title suggests, we're going to take a look at this rally that we just experienced for the last two days. Does it have legs, and can it continue in the December? We're also going to take a look at, uh, or what I like to say, that my philosophy hasn't changed, and everybody's a genius. Then we'll talk about elections as far as midterms that are coming up here in the United States and how that could affect the market. And lastly, we'll take a look at some positive news, as I call it Build-A-Bear, and that is the Cash App. So first things first. This uh, came across the desk, it was pretty interesting, and it took a look at a Santa Claus rally. What I'm taking a look at here is there was a video, and this is uh, Dr. Yardini from Yardini Research. And he's talking to MSNBC or CNBC about how this rally that we're having right now could extend into to, uh, December and why. But first, the question I wanna ask is, who is Dr. Yardini? Why should we listen to this gentleman? Well, here's his biography. Dr. Yardini is the president of Yardini Research, he was the chief investment strategist of Oak Associates Prudential Equity Group and Deutsche Bank's U.S. Equities Division in New York City. Also chief economist of C.J. Lawrence, Prudence Box Securities and E.F. Hutton, taught at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business, and also was an economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and held positions at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors and the U.S. Treasury Department in Washington, D.C. So the things he's going to talk about here as to the relevance of why this could potentially be a rally that extends in December does have some merits. Just take a listen. Well, I think we're in a trading range uh, from the June low 3,666. We did recently drop below that, but I think uh, we're just kind of making a bot another bottom here right around that level. And then uh, in the summer, we went from uh, all the way up to 4,305 in uh, August 16th, uh, obviously still well below the uh, record high we had at the beginning of the year, but I think we're in that kind of range. And I think that we're gonna get another Santa Claus rally and Santa Claus rallies are particularly pre predictable and strong uh, as a result of midterm elections. And it almost really doesn't matter uh, whether the, uh, which way the House and the Senate go. The midterm elections, no matter what, have a tendency to be very bullish and the Santa Claus rally just continues right for the next three, six, 12 months. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the data if you want it, but uh, I don't know if you want me to throw data at you this late in, uh, late, this late in the afternoon on a Friday. Well, I mean, you're, you're talking about a Santa Claus rally, but what if it's too icy and dicey because of the Fed, right? And rates are going to well, remain high. The Fed's going to remain hawkish, and stocks aren't going to be able to rally nearly the amount that you suggest they might be able to. Well, Scott, I listened into your show earlier, and I, I heard you mention something about the possibility that the market might already be, dis be discounting all that. I think at this point, the market knows they're going to do 75 basis points uh, in early November. And now only that the market's confused about whether it's going to be 75 or 50 basis points in December. I thought it was going to be 275s one after the other, but now the Fed's throwing some uh, uncertainty about that. I think what the market's looking for is for a pause. I don't think they're looking for a pivot. They're looking for a pause. The Fed's been awfully aggressive, 300 basis points so far since March, another 75 basis points in uh, early November. And I think they will go ahead with another 75 basis points in December. But I think the market knows all that. And I think the market, as we saw today, got a lift from the idea that it might be only 50 basis points, and then there might be a pause for a while. Now, the economy is doing pretty well under the circumstances when all, uh, all things considered. I think one of the reasons it's doing so well is because the strong dollar looks like it should be weighing on the economy, but the dollar is strong because money is absolutely pouring in to our capital markets. So over $1.6 trillion, $1.6 trillion came into the uh, uh, into our markets from, from overseas on balance over the 12 months, and that's through August. And the strong dollar is telling me money is still coming in. And that's a big positive for our economy. So there's a lot to unpack there with uh, what Dr. Ardini said. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is how everything did as far as midterms. And of course, we've talked about this numerous times in the channel. But uh, yes, here in the U.S., as far as midterms, we take a look at uh, who is going to win Congress, who is going to take control of Senate or the House of Representatives. We can see that all the way back in the 60s, uh, as you see right here in the middle frame, before the midterm, the S&P 500 price, usually it's down. Negative 17% in the 60s, negative 14, 74, negative 31%. That was right before uh, the Great Recession, almost a depression. And the only one that was really good was uh, Ronald Reagan, 20% or so. And then uh, now here we are, Joe Biden, negative 20%. But if we can just take a look at the averages, and we see right here that the S&P 500 price 
uh, after three months, within three months after the midterm elections, uh, Dr. Udini is right. The midterm average is you're looking at negative 1% on the average of before, and then a positive 7%, then in six months, a positive 15, and then in up to a year, a positive 16%. So that's a positive, and uh, we can see that that could potentially play a factor. Also, the thing we talked about, a, the US dollar index, the Dixie, and the strength of the dollar. And actually, it's uh, going down a little bit, as we can see right here over the last day. We were we topped out at, I think, around 114 or so, 112, 113.31, yeah, roughly. And now here we are coming down. But as he talks about uh, trillions or 1.4 trillion uh, capital is flowing into. And another thing that he didn't mention, but I've heard someplace else, is that uh, one of the reasons that a potential rally is going on in traditional markets and in crypto right now is the treasury rate or the 10-year treasury yields. And we can take a look at uh, what's happening with just the 10-year. We can break it down by one month and three months. And you can't really see it too much, but the treasury notes, treasury bills, T-bills, notes, you can see right here that uh, they've actually they've been going up for a while, which uh, means that, hey, if you want, say, uh, a little bit of stability, maybe put it over here and then we'll give you 4%. And it's been very flat uh, beforehand, but you can just see right here at the apex, 4.25 for the uh, three month. Now it's on a 4.25. Also, if you take a look at the six month, uh, same thing. We had peaked out around 4.25 and now we're down to 4.1, which is to, to me, really not a big deal, but to economists and people who really take a look at the treasury rates, this could be something huge. And even the even the one year, very hard to see, but we topped out at 4.25, now we're at 4.1. So what that means is that maybe there's a little bit more stability coming down the pipe, just like what Dr. Yardini, Dr. Yardini said when he talked about, hey, uh, there's a lot of things that are going on, but uh, maybe uh, the Fed isn't not pivoting, but slowing down. And because of that, that could potentially lead to what he called that Santa Claus rally. Now, how does that take a look as far as what's going on in the traditional markets? Not too great, honestly. Uh, today, uh, the NASDAQ, or excuse me, the uh, yeah, NASDAQ is down. Uh, we went from 11,193, oh, down to 11,000. If we take a look at the five day, still down one month, eh, up a little bit, six months, and of course, one year still down, but there was a little bit of a, a slight rally. Also S&P 500, again, the same thing. One day, five day, looking pretty good. One month, okay. Six month, not so great. And then one year. The big question though is, well, how does that work for, for crypto and digital assets? Well, our market is doing pretty good. And last uh, 24 hours, we're at 3.7% up, Ethereum 6.2, but you can see a little bit of a decline the last hour. We are in the red for some parts, but we're still above the one trillion market cap. So when he talks about these rallies, of course, we're gonna go up and down. We could see a little bit of rally here and there, but this is again, a bear market rally. Do not confuse this with, oh, we're gonna to go to the moon uh, very soon. It's just not how it works. But there's a thing that we could take a look at as to why we are doing so well. And one of those is liquidations and shorts. And this is just a, an example. I would like to leave this here. Hopefully you can, this can burn into your brain, but. You know, whenever they talk about everybody goes in a certain direction and then everybody starts to follow up, it only takes a little bit of effort to really go in the reverse opposite way and make a ton of money. So right now, the people that are going long, there's a short squeeze going on. And right now, we've lost, the shorts, they've lost over, oh, about $1.3, $1.4 billion in the last 24 hours. So if you're in a short position, it probably would have made sense a couple of days ago. You might have said, well, this is where things are going. But in reality, that's not what it is. And then also the thing that I always take a look at is does this, this rally that we have going on, does it have any legs? What is the volume going on? There's a great website called nomics.com, a link in the description. And you can separate or you can filter everything as far as the volume percentage and the volume numbers. Finance is by far the biggest. So was there a lot of volume? Well, in the last 24 hours, we can see that was 11 billion. Well, if we take a look at a week, yeah, pretty high. One month, yeah, about an average. One year, mostly about an average. So it wasn't a low uh, type of situation. It actually had a little bit of merit to what happened. So we take a look also at uh, besides Binance, the volume here is, uh, let me s separate this. OKX, $22 billion in the last 24 hours. So let's take a look at a day, one week. All right. Was that $19 billion one month? All right. One year. And we can see that 
pretty much an average of one of the peaks, not uh, a low volume pump. So there is something to be said about that. And then also let's take a look at uh, FTX. One day, we're looking at uh, almost $3 billion. Uh, one week, it's, uh, 15 billion as far as on October 24th. Wow. And then one month, one year, we can see it's a little bit low, but not too bad. So has does this uh, leg have a little bit of pump? Sure. Or does the pump have a little bit of uh, leg space and could it run? It could. But again, uh, nobody really knows the future. Nobody really knows what's going on. And also, I was going to leave this up here for people in the comment section. I had a question yesterday because we had talked about regulations a couple of days ago. And one of the things that we talked about was uh, Sam Bacon Fried about what his position is and how he was handling things. And I just had a question for everybody. I know there's a lot of a lot of. Um, comments going around about SBF, but I asked the question on, on Twitter, what's the specific problem with SBF and what is he doing in the crypto space that is egregious? Some say he's a savior, while a good amount of people saying he's a devil. Don't give me opinions, give me facts. Comment below. And this was from Divine Art, where he talks about, hey, you got to take a look at this guy. And most everything that I got was not facts. It was just a bunch of hyperbole and uh, maybe and opinions so if you have a specific reason why SPF is the devil incarnate for uh, crypto, please leave that in the comment section below. And that'll lead me to my last points here before we move on. My philosophy hasn't changed. Look, uh, we have these rallies. They're called bear market rallies. I know how people will look at these and go, this is it. This is going to take off. It's going to the moon. Slow down. These bear market rallies, they could be, they could be extended. But uh, usually this isn't the catalyst. Take a look at the macro events. Has there been anything that's that happened uh, globally with the uh, reserve, the, the uh, global banks? Has there been anything that's happened uh, specifically with the war in Ukraine? Has there been anything that's uh, happened with uh, the Fed definitely pivoting? Not really. So when I take a look at all these things, I'm like, what are the factors that really could lead to a big rally? I'm not so sure, but I will tell you this. My philosophy hasn't changed. I still dollar cost average. And I still am going to take profits along the way. Matter of fact, I just took profits today. I was buying Bitcoin around the 18400 range. I was buying Ethereum around the $1,300 range. And uh, I ladder in and I ladder out. Uh, I know some people will say, well, that's not a good strategy because I'm just going to wait for the moon. Do whatever you want to. This is not financial advice. These are the things that I am doing. I can't tell you what to do. I'm not your dad. So let me know what you think about that in the comments section. That will also lead me to... One more point, which is about the balance as far as your portfolio. So I'd like to thank Masterworks for, again, sponsoring the video. When I talk about balance, when something goes down, you want the other part to go up and vice versa. You don't want to put everything into whatever uh, basket that you have. It's best just to balance things out because uh, over time, it seems to work out. So for me, this is my, my wheelhouse. Cash, stable coins, some degens, land, property, Amazon business, staking, IRA, but Masterworks itself, this is buying fractionalized shares of fine art. So I've got two myself, Banksy and a Basquiat. And over a year now, that's October 26th now, uh, I'm up uh, 40% for the Basquiat painting. Remember, these are fractionalized shares. So this is what they've done as far as their performance uh, over and over again. Looks like it's been pretty good. And this is the performance year to date. As far as Masterworks versus Russell, NASDAQ, S&P 500. And I can tell you right now, it's kicking the pants off of uh, crypto itself. It's also not correlated to uh, real estate, gold, or S&P 500. It's uncorrelated asset. And a couple of the reasons are this. Uh, rich people are crazy. They like, they like their art. And uh, this is a prime example. A Banksy was, uh, sh was uh, on sale for $1.8 million. Banksy shredded it. Now it's worth $25.4 million. You don't ask why. These are just the things that uh, Masterworks takes a look at and said, this is an appreciating asset. And then also, don't worry, this is actually registered with the SEC because it is a security. And you can take a look at all the paintings and all the things that are offered, which are listed on the SEC's website, links in the description. So if that's something you'd be interested in, just take a look uh, at the description down below. And uh, there is a link, and you can check that out and skip the wait line. And that will take care of that. So now, real quick, as we were talking about midterm elections, only transition to this little piece. I thought it was interesting uh, because I always thought I was in the, in the minority of wanting regulations. Well, apparently I'm not. So this is a story uh, from Fortune. More than four in five U.S. voters say politicians' crypto position could affect how they vote. 
As the November 8th U.S. midterm elections grow closer, Crypto Council for Innovation released the poll of likely voters highlighting the impact of crypto on voting decisions. I got to tell you, this would, uh, this would sway me in opinion. If someone was anti-crypto, I couldn't vote for them. Some 84% of those polled said a politician's position on crypto would be a factor in, in determining their vote. But I have to pet the mix, uh, preface this. The vast majority said it would be minor. That's okay. Uh, some people say it's minor. Some people say it would be a big deal. So Corey Gardner, former U.S. Senator from Colorado, said voters want this to be taken seriously. They want the potential to be recognized. And I got to tell you, with the razor thin edge that uh, the Democrats hold in Senate and, of course, in the House of Representatives, where I think that's going to be flipped as well, uh, these types of, of uh, talking points, the things that uh, people are concerned with, become at the forefront. So every little thing counts. The poll reveals that crypto is a motivating factor, uh, whether they hold any crypto or not, especially given the negative headlines of hacks. And this is where it says, how likely voters feel about crypto regs. This was amazing to me because on this channel, I've always said this is an unpopular opinion, but apparently it is not. There it is. It's a, uh, this is a popular opinion. How likely voters feel about crypto regulations. 52% said we need more regulations. Only 7% needs fewer and 20% have had enough, 21% no, uh, don't know already. So over half, so I'm in the majority. Uh, let me know what you think about that in the comment section, but it's amazing to me that I think people are starting to get it, that for institutions to come in, we're gonna need regulations because their whole preface is this, it's not about making money, it's about wealth preservation. And there is no good sense for them to come in here and then have the SEC come about and go, oh, guess what? Everything's security. Or they get into DeFi and go, oh, guess what? Everything just got hacked and then, uh, then away it goes. That's not a recipe for success. So let me just think about that in the comments and let's finish up with some positive news, Cash App. So Cash App, I've used sparingly. I didn't really think it was a big deal, but I can see why this is going to take, make a difference. So the Cash App users can now send and receive Bitcoin via Lightning. Lightning, if you don't know, Second layer solution sits on top of Bitcoin and it makes transaction costs cheap. How cheap? Less than a penny. And uh, for me as a small business owner, that is huge because I pay a lot of fees, 2.99% plus 30 cents. And we'll take a look at the fees and how much it compares to lighting. So here's what's happening. Previously, Cash App users could only send Bitcoin via the Lightning Network. Now they can use a solution to receive and send, which sounds pretty good. A lot, with the Lightning, there is typically little to no fees involved. It's used to send smaller amounts of Bitcoin. This is from the Cash App website. But there is a $999 limit every seven days with the Lightning integration. This is only available to US customers except those in New York State. Surprise, uh, says the app's website. And there's 44 million monthly users. Let me say that again. I didn't know that. 44 million monthly users. That's huge. So the question that I have was this. Well, if they're using Bitcoin to send and receive and you know that just to send, What's the cost of Bitcoin right now to send it off? Because I don't really know. So there's a great website, widecharts.com, link in the description, you can find this. This measures the average fees in US dollars. And you can see that uh, it's a $1.34 to send Bitcoin, which I got to tell you, isn't the greatest, but that's an average, just so you know, that is an average. But we can, we can go back five years or so. We can see there was some huge transaction fees. Remember in 20, wow, April, 2021, $62. That's uh, pretty ridiculously high. Yeah, and that's the truth. So in my opinion, Bitcoin wasn't ready to be used as a currency. Sorry, just wasn't. Uh, Lightning comes along and changes all that. Now, the real question is then, is Lightning Network only is less than a penny? Makes sense. Well, how much is, does Cash App charge just for sending things around? So Cash App fee sending money uh, via credit card is 3%. Instant transfer is between half a percentage and 1.75, which could be expensive. I mean, spending a uh, hundred or a thousand dollars. Investing zero from cash, buying or selling crypto two or 3%, uh, and then ETM withdrawals two to 250. So if you're using Cash App just to send and receive and using Lightning Network now for less than a penny, that's huge. What will make it uh, extremely huge and more importantly is if it branches off outside the US, gets in New York, also the UK and third world countries. Now that would be a game changer. Anyhow, so that's it for today. So look, I know one a little bit long, a lot of things going on. As you can tell, we are uh, out of El Paso, sitting here in Houston. We'll be back in Puerto Rico soon. We'll do a meetup. 
But that is it for today. So look, I appreciate you step, stopping by, hanging with me. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Also consider subscribing. A lot of things we talk about are sensitive. That's it for today. So thanks so much. I appreciate it. I'll see you on the next one.